you all for um, for attending this event, for being here. Uh, as the poster said, uh, you know, we're happy to have you here to celebrate the publication of the sort of four language edition of Seymour's uh, Seymour Main's uh, book of one word sonnets, uh, Wind and Wood, which is also uh, called um, Viento y Madera, Vent et Bois, y Vento y Madera in Portuguese. And what is uh, very interesting about today's uh, event <coughs> is we'll be able to read uh, from the uh, book in those four languages, in, French, in English, of course, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. And uh, with us, we have and Seymour will say a few words about um, <clears throat> the project and how this project came about in, uh, in, in these four languages. But we have, um, we're lucky because today uh, we have Seymour, but we also have, I guess, all of the translators, or minus the uh, Portuguese translator. But um, we have Laura. Uh, Spoturno from the Universidad La Plata, Nacional La Plata in Argentina, who is visiting us at New Ottawa right now for a few more weeks. And um, it says here, translators, Max Charon and Veronique Lassau, but seriously, it's Veronique Lassau, okay? Uh, Veronique did all the work here, uh, and I just had the pleasure to read her versions, which Seymour uh, uh, enjoyed very much. And another colleague, um, <coughs> uh, another colleague from Brazil, Consi, who can't be with us today, who did the um, the versions into uh, Portuguese, right? Okay, um, but we have from the School of Translation a PhD student, Ricardo, who will be reading the versions. A new PhD student from Rio who will be reading the versions later on in Portuguese. Now, I don't, I think most of you know Seymour. Everybody knows Seymour. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so I want, you know, a big introduction. Uh, it's, it would be, it would take some time. Seymour, um, I mean, I don't, I've stopped counting the number of books of poetry, anthologies, and so on and so forth that, that Seymour has published throughout, uh, throughout the last few decades. Um, but just uh, as, I guess, you know, a bit more personal, uh, we were just saying, and this story I think each of us has told many times before, but, and some of you might know it, some of you might not, but Seymour and I actually met, what is it, 37, September, eight, yes? September 1982. Yes, yes, 37 years ago, <laughs> when Seymour was a visiting prof at Concordia in Montreal, and I was just starting out uh, my university studies, and I had registered uh, a bit foolishly. I can't, but I had registered, and I believe a, a liberal arts program at Concordia, and I had a creative writing poetry workshop that ran through the whole year. Right, from it was like a six credit course, and um, of all the courses I had, it's the only one I kept. And uh, I, um, I've always been since then fond. Of creating, uh, of creative writing, of translating poetry, which I've had lately the uh, opportunity of doing, but it was a, a great time uh, back there in '82, and um, and then we touched base uh, 25 years uh, later when Seymour was here, and I became prof here at uh, U Ottawa. So it's uh, it's fun. It's nice. Seymour's a friend, uh, vieux mentor. Right, not a vieux mentor, but a vieux mentor, um, and so I'm happy to have the chance to introduce Seymour, even though everybody here in this room pretty much knows Seymour and knows uh, a bit of his work. So uh, I'll let Seymour introduce Laura, uh, and and then Laura wants to talk a bit about how this book project came about, and then we will do uh, a bit of reading from the book in four languages, Monsieur. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. 
Mark is not telling the full story, but I'll keep part of it suppressed, Mark. Uh, in the course that he took in 1982, there were two Marks, actually. Mark Shainbloom, who's the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cartoonist, who's known for, uh, I think, uh, What's it called? Canada Man. He's done different different books. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark, I have trouble with the two Marks in the class. I remember. And we met on Wednesdays, <laughs> if I remember. It was uh, no, we had one Fridays. Fridays. No, uh, Wednesdays and Fridays. And I remember early, which I didn't like, because I had to take the subway all the way. But Concordia was built on top of a subway station in those days, and it was small. Uh, it was a. It was, and then years later he showed up, but I didn't recognize him because he had shorn his locks. So I forgot about that, right? <laughs> his locks were gone. But um, uh, I'm really pleased, uh, I welcome you all, friends and, uh, and colleagues and students and ex-students and some friends of mine from the, I would say, retired diplomats too, <laughs> who are here today. Um, I went to Argentina the first time 15 years ago because a book of my short stories were published uh, in Cordoba, which is the second largest city, and they invited me, the university invited me to be a visiting professor for a short period of time. And then, of course, the Canadian Embassy decided, we got you here, we're gonna use you. So we're gonna send you around to all these campuses to stir up Canadian studies and Canadian literature. And one of the places I went to, a place I'd never heard of up to that day, was La Plata, which is the capital of the province of Buenos Aires. And that day, my greeter, uh, two people, there were two people who were teaching in the department, and one of them was Laura here. And I don't know what happened, I, if you, I don't remember what I said that time, because it was the first of four visits to La Plata over the next 15 years, but I remember that I must have given her a little pamphlet, and you're gonna be talking about that? A little pamphlet of my word sonnets, because at early, about 2001, 2002, as a result of uh, communications or correspondence with the Irish poet Augustus Young, who had discovered, and you're going to mention that? I uh, know? Good. So <laughs> he set up the words, the words song had been written. Uh, for example, Rambeau tried the word song. One word, 14 lines. I wanted two American poets who tried it, but Augustus Young, one day, and he was a, a, a medical a doctor, Irish, but lived in London. He never liked to be called English, of course. He took uh, Churchill's History of the English People and fed part of it into his computer. And then he found out that the average number of words per, set, uh, per sentence was 14. He then, like in the found poetry, he set it up and found that he had Churchillian found poems, and he called them word sonnets. And he spread this word around. My publisher in London let me know about it. And uh, one day I just tried it. And then it became an addiction. And over the next uh, 20 years, I wrote hundreds of them, but I select them into smaller books. One of the books um, is Ricochet, which is the second ah, there it is. Good, you have it all organized. Um, so the second time I came back to La Plata, we did, I, I was presented with a bilingual edition of my first little chapbook of word songs. The third time I came to La Plata, I was presented with a book by a publisher with my full collection Ricochet done in, uh, in, uh, in both languages. And then uh, the fourth trip was the first I got a sequence of my poems done in a trilingual edition, uh, Spanish, but also French by my French, one of my French translators, a lovely book. Uh, and these, these two books here, translations, really were my original book cusps. I have a few copies. My publisher said I can sell them today at a deep discount. He'll accept the loss just to have people have a copy. So what we've ended up, in fact, doing is um, uh, with Wind, uh, with uh, Winglewood, is go one language further and actually cover the four major European languages of the Americas in a way. And um, I think it was a wonderful experiment. Now, Laura uh, started in the department. Now she's a research professor at the university, uh, which means unlike we don't have those positions in Canada where she does most of her work in research rather than teaching, and the University of Ottawa, we teach and teach and teach and research and research, maybe. We have time but we do teach a lot. I don't know if they hear me on Tabaret or not, but we <laughs> teach more in our faculty than any other faculties in the whole province, believe it or not. So, um, she's a super professor, and there are the lovely four books. You have it so well organized, I won't say anything more. I'm really pleased to welcome, uh, to welcome Laura here again. She's come a number of times to do research here, and I was pleased that she came at one time to attend the reception at the green door, the marriage of my daughter. That goes back about eight years. And you just arrived just at the right time. I'm happy 
that you enjoyed yourself at that wonderful party. We took over the Green Door on a Monday, and we got we put in liquor and food. And we had a wonderful time. And if you go to the Green Door and ask to do it, they'll never do it again, <laughs> because they said they got wiped out out of just energy because they have Monday off. And they gave us the whole Monday. We had a wonderful time. So without further ado, Laura. After Laura gives her talk. We're going to read and give you a little sampling in four languages of these poems to get some sense of how they sound and what they mean. Laura? Okay, well, thank you. Seymour, for the introduction. <laughs> so, my name is Maria Laura and as Seymour was just saying, I'm Mark. This is my fourth visit to the University of Ottawa as a visiting scholar. I was very lucky in the past to benefit from uh, the Understanding Canada program, which was unfortunately uh, shut now. And uh, in Seymour's first visit to Argentina, I had to act as the contact person for him. So this is how actually we met. We exchanged some emails, and then we met personally. I just organized a talk, and he volunteered as the sponsor for my visit uh, to Canada that was going to happen in September 2004. That is exactly 15 years ago. So when I got back to Argentina that first time, I asked Seymour if he thought it was okay for us to translate his first uh, book, Hail, Word Sonnets, which was his first published uh, Word Sonnet uh, sequence. And uh, I was going to translate that, uh, I think it was 16 poems in, in, that, uh, in that sequence with my undergrad students. So <clears throat> the experience really proved uh, successful, productive, creative. Students love translating uh, this minimalist poetry, and it was possible for them to do it, right? These are <clears throat> th third for the year undergrad students, excuse me. <coughs> and um, uh, in general, students are used to translating fragments from novels or fragments from stories. You cannot translate you know, a novel with a group of students in uh, just two, three months. But uh, this uh, proposed um, a possible challenge, and one which was creative, sort of artistic, and intellectual. The condition keeping these 14 lines, 14 words in, um, in the translation was something that we uh, really had to struggle at times, but really enjoyed coming up to some result uh, as a group. So translators, um, I mean students of translation, would work in separate groups, in Argentina I mean, and then we would gather together, share the translations, and come up with one version. So perhaps at the beginning of the session we had 14 different versions, but our goal was to come with one. Of course, then we would have reading and uh, assessment of those translations. So, as Seymour was saying, <coughs> the first uh, sequence, bilingual was, uh, sequence, was the one we published in 2006, and Seymour was there in May to uh, launch the book with us. The second, one of our favorites actually, <coughs> is Reflecos. Then we had On the Cut, in which we invited Sabine uh, Hein, whom I met here in Ottawa, and then we now watch came as a result of my last visit to Ottawa in 2011, when we thought it could be, uh, it was time to include uh, the other major European, of course, language spoken in the Americas. And so we came up with uh, Wind and Wood. Mm. So that's the name of my uh, university, and as Seymour said, I am a research professor, because my affiliation is double. I also work for CONICET. This is what allows me to devote most of my time um, to, uh, to research. So, our participants and languages, um, as Seymour was saying, uh, for Por and Mark, for Portuguese, we counted on the collaboration of Maria da Concepcion Vinciclova from UNIFOA, Centro Universitario da Volta Redonda in Brazil, and today Ricardo is going to kindly read uh, the Portuguese version she did for this book. In French, uh, at that time, Veronique Lessard, she was a graduate student working with uh, Mark Charon for her master's, uh, which is now complete. And it was really, um, it was really uh, nice for me to work um, as co general coordinator for this project uh, for the, with the port translators from uh, Brazilian Portuguese, Canadian French. And then, of course, in all the process, uh, we counted on Seymour May, who was always willing to answer our questions and give us also his opinion on the different versions in Spanish, Portuguese, and French. 
Um, in the case of the Spanish version, there were about 60 undergrad uh, students working on, on the translation. This was, yes, <laughs> so <laughs> Mark is looking at me. Yeah, 60, uh, and for uh, some other books, there were about 100 students, because we would be working with the translations over two years, right? And so uh, we would set special sessions, and so students from the year before would come, gather, uh, help, etc. So it was a very, uh, a very nice work for us as well. Now, in the process, uh, we were working, collaborating with each other over time, reading and rereading, translating and retranslating, and seeing how these uh, poems originally written in Canadian English could be reinscribed in the languages, in the other languages that we wanted to include in the selection. There were other expert reading, readers of this sequence giving us their opinion, and after their readings, we would you know, revise our translations and see uh, what, the, um, what, what we wanted the book to, to look like. The layout was also tricky. I don't know if you remember how to set the books, because in general, in the other books, we had, as it, it is usually the case in Western languages, the original, in poetry bilingual, the original, and then the translations, but Seymour accepted that we would have all languages at the same level. And for uh, the people at the publishing house, that was also difficult to do, so uh, the edition process was also uh, hard. And <clears throat> so this collaboration would include uh, the active then participation of the poem, the different <coughs> translating groups, the translators from one language into uh, the other, and then the view of expert readers and reviewers. There is not much more I want to say because Simon covered uh, some of the uh, features of this particular and very beautiful uh, genre. So um, I'm very happy to be here, and Mark perhaps would like to say a few well, I just, more yes, words I, before thank you, Laura. we um, Right. I just wanted to say um, that this was, <clears throat> I think, a very interesting project where uh, I had the chance. And since then, we've collaborated. But I've had the chance, I had a great opportunity to be Veronique's uh, master thesis uh, supervisor. And then uh, when Seymour and Laura told me about this project, I asked Veronique if she'd be interested in participating, which she did. And she, I think, enjoyed this project. And she might say a few words about how you translate this particular form. Uh, and since then, I've been collaborating a bit more with uh, Veronique on. Uh, two books that are coming out <coughs> in the next few months, uh, probably early winter uh, for both of them. And so, yes, it was, um, it was great experience and also a great experience too. All of us, perhaps except Laura maybe, right, but had worked previously, Seymour and I, with, uh, with Concy in Brazil. Uh, and so um, for another book that we did in a, a Portuguese a version. So this was, um, yes, it was also very much about colleagues and friends working together um, and a very enjoyable, uh, very enjoyable project. I don't know if Seymour wants to say a few things about the cover, which I find is beautiful. Uh, and then I think we can just go ahead and, and read, right? Yes, I should say a few more words about the, the, uh, the sonnet, the word sonnet form, because when I got enthusiastic about it, I was teaching, of course, creative writing courses, and I... I spread my enthusiasm to my students and even to the non-students. And before I knew it, uh, the Augustus Young, uh, who had then retired to England, uh, I mean to, to France, wrote me and said, "You know, Ottawa is the world center for the word sonnet." <laughs> so we did an anthology online, which was part of a project of creative writing called Friday Circle. We have an online site for the department for about 20, 15 years now. In the department and one of the students who graduated, we then uh, asked local writers and students, and one of them, like Cyril Davidin, contributed. So we put a, we did an anthology of the word sonnet, and it's, it's an online, one of the earliest online anthologies. It goes back to 2004. And what astonishes at me is that it shows up everywhere in bibliography. One little event, one group of students here with a professor and one or two other writers putting together an anthology, telling the story of the word sonnet, suddenly went viral. And you show, it shows up in articles. I even noticed that in the history of the sonnet, uh, on Wiki, there's a mention of the anthology and what we did. I thought this is, a, this is a, I never thought of it when the students and I got together to do this. 
Um, and all this came together just out of, not as a, a being forced to work together, but things just, you know, bounced off each other and things that, you know, really worked together um, in, the tra in the translation project. I should say that after my earlier books of word songs came out or spread internationally, suddenly it became a, a new form that suddenly began to show up. I gave a, a lecture, uh, two lectures at Tel Aviv University in 2011, and within four years, two leading Hebrew poets in Israel published books of word songs thanking me, and three English language writers sent me their books. Um, I can tell you other stories like that suddenly, and because the internet makes everything available, and if my name's attached, you just look up my name and send me an email. And I'm amazed how many people around the world have, uh, you know, have, um, I've seen the word sonnet, and the next word sonnet, this book, a cusp, which this is the second half of, will be launched first, but not in St. Petersburg, but in Ottawa, because uh, we have a complete Russian bilingual edition of it, which has just come out in, in Russia by a publisher. So it's con it keeps on, it keeps on. I have, there's someone in Italy, trans I just think in Italy translated, um, uh, someone, uh, in, uh, I forgot, one other, Italy, and I know there's some other, and it was also translated into Romanian, uh, the sequence, the earlier book, which, which came out, got published in Romanian. So I don't, the words on it just, it just keeps on going, and I think those who begin to write it find that it's an addictive form. I, I have trouble now writing anything without having it in 14 word sentences now. It's becoming, it's even affecting my emails, my, any critical <laughs> work, I constantly have 14 words, and I think, there may be, I can't prove it, there may be some little um, mechanism in the brain that once you get into a certain syntactical structure, it stays with you and it get, replicates and works off, so to speak, off its loop. So I will, we will start reading a few of these just to give you a sample of, um, of what they're like. So maybe you want to stand up, you want to stand up, we can do it all together. You're not reading, right? Oh yeah, you're reading Spanish, sorry. So we came, The first one is, you always read on it, page 26. So we're at a quartet now, you see? <laughs> and if I got a guitar in here, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, though actually, somebody did compose music. <coughs> we launched that years ago, Hail, uh, yeah. uh, to, these, to these earlier. OK, so the first poem is a title poem for this section of Cusp, which is the, this full book, Wind and Wood. Frivolous, we pass the hours, ears gently tapped by the xylophone of wind and wood. Viento y madera, frívolos, pasamos las horas, golpeté el oído un delicado xilófono de viento y madera. Vent et bois, frivolement, on passe le temps. Tinkpan, feutré, du xylophone, de vent et de bois. Vento et madeira. Frivolous, passamos as horas, os ouvidos batidos delicadamente por xilofone de vento et madeira. Normally, when I read alone with other languages, I read the poems in the haiku style once, and then I read it a second time, but we won't do that now here. The next one is called Surrender, page 30. The telephone doesn't work. The internet is a black hole. Words have given up. <laughs> Rendición. El teléfono no funciona. Internet es un agujero negro. Las palabras se han rendido. Capitulation. Le téléphone ne fonctionne plus. Internet est un trou noir. Les mots ont capitulé. Rendición. O telefone não funciona. A internet é um buraco negro. As palavras já desistiram. Next one is Fiddler, page 33. You all have heard or watched or seen a version of Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler. When I was young, no fiddler dared to play on an icy Montreal roof. Violinista. <laughs> <laughs> Cuando joven, no había violinista que osara tocar sobre los blancos tejados de Montreal. Violinista. 
Quand j'étais jeune, aucun violoniste n'aurait osé jouer sur les toits glacés de Montréal. Violiniste. Quand eu era jovem, nenhum violinista ousava, ousava tocar em um telhado gelado de Montreal. The next one is a favorite of mine, which has been quoted in various places. It's called Used Car. Uh, it's not about a car, but for people, some of you may have heard me sometimes complain. I just come back from the garage, namely the clinic or the hospital. This is called Used Car. Old age is like a used car. No sooner fix one part, another goes. Coche usado. La vejez es como un coche usado. Apenas reparas una pieza, otra se rompe. Voiture usagée. La vieillesse est comme une voiture usagée. Sitôt une pièce réparée, une autre flanche. Carro usado. A velhice é como um carro usado. Então logo se conserta uma parte, outra estraga. The next one is tongue, uh, and it's on page 38. Rain is the tongue of resurrection. Its myriad accents rousing roots, bulbs, and seeds. Lengua. La lluvia es la lengua de resurrección. Acentos infinitos animan raíces, bulbos y semillas. Langue. La pluie es langue de resurrección. Ses mille accents charme, racines, bulbes y semences. Lingua. Chuva es la lengua de resurrección. Miríade de sotaques animando raíces, bulbos y sementes. Underground, page 45. Drought in autumn. The flow of words has gone underground, below speech and sight. Clandestino. Sequía otoñal. El caudal de palabras clandestino escapa bajo el habla y la vista. Enfui. Sécheresse d'automne. Le fleuve des mots. Enfui. Échappe à la voix et au regard. Terra abaixo. Seca no outono, o fluxo das palavras escorreu terra abaixo, sob fala e visão. Take off, page 49. The heart flutters ever so gently, a moth practicing for night takeoff and maneuvers. Despegue. El coração tenue aletea. Una, plani una polilla practica para el despegue y las maniobras nocturnas. Décollage. Le cœur palpite tout bas. Papillon nocturne qui répète pour son vol de nuit. Décollage. O coração palpita tão delicadamente. Mariposa a treinar para décollage nocturna y manobras. The next poem is called Day. I see it says for Adam Furstenberg, it was written for uh, one of my dearest friends, a late colleague from Ryerson University, Adam Furstenberg, who was the first scholar in Canada to write about the connection between Yiddish literature and Jewish Canadian. And um, I wrote this poem for him when he was alive. And uh, I couldn't attend his funeral, unfortunately, but what always touches me is his widow decided that this poem was going to be read as part of the service at his funeral. Day. Blessed is the light that returns, renewing the day different from all other days. Día. Bendita la luz que regresa, renovando el día diferente de todos los demás días. Jour. Combien béni est la lumière qui fait renaître chaque jour sous un jour nouveau. Día. Abençoada a luz que retorna, renovando o dia diferente de todos os outros dias. And the last closing poem in the collection, Gravity. Molecules, breasts, the kiss of fingerprints. What did we let fly from love's gravity? Gravidad. Moléculas, techos, besos de huellas digitales. Que dejamos escapar? de la gravedad del amor. 
Gravité. Molécules. 5. Caresse d'empreinte digitale. Quoi encore s'échappe de l'amour et de sa gravité? Gravidade. Moléculas, seios, beijo, de pontas de dedos. O que escapou da gravidade do amor? Thank you. And I want to tell you in the book, there is a kind of preface introduction. Laura teased things out of me and I wrote a kind of history of uh, the form and what led me to write it and the poetics of the form. So if you read Spanish, it's here, I think it should be published in English actually, mm -hmm. the original. If you read Spanish, it's in this uh, collection. Um, at this point, we didn't want to keep you all afternoon. If you, uh, We've opened for some questions and then we have heaps of cookies and, uh, <laughs> to sweeten uh, your enjoyment and still coffee and juice, which we want you to consume and not leave a crumb behind. I hear my mother, late mother's voice when I hear that, you know, leave not a crumb behind. So anyone have any questions? We just read about a sample, and it's really nice to interest to hear it. Well, English is so different. These three languages here have echoes with each other more than English, you know. What's amazing when I hear the Spanish and the French and the, and the Portuguese, how um, there's so many similar words, the sounds are slightly different, but there's a kind of, a, how should I call it, a kind of a linking, uh, kind of melodic themes carry, whereas English stands back a bit because it really is not related to the other three languages. Uh, and let me tell you, English is not related to Romanian either. I've had translation or to, to the Russian version either. But this is a, a kind of a, a unique thing. And I tell you, I got an email from my uh, muse who runs my word sonnets, uh, you know, and in 14 words. And what she said is, uh, thank them all because they made the poems, uh, they put the poems on the lips of others in their tongue, which is really a miracle always, you know. But if anyone have any questions, you can ask Laura. She's the expert now, you know. Uh, if, she, if you have a question, I only want to say is, I didn't know how many people were involved in La Plata, but next time I come, which is I hope next year, I think I'm going to get, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, T-shirts printed up, you know. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I don't know what to call them. Uh, Word sonneteers, or maybe I should call them menistas, right? Uh, like, you know, uh, the followers of uh, Maine's word sonnets, or we can call them, you know, uh, word sonnets. Or something. But I think I should bring a hundred t shirts for each one of them, you know, with maybe a word sonnet on it to thank them for their work, you know. And it's amazing that she was able to get all these people together harmoniously working together with enthusiasm. You have to tell us what you put into the water supply in the, in the faculty there. Tell me. I, I, I think it'd be interesting if they're willing, Laura and uh, Veronique, to say a few words about uh, the particular challenges or challenge of uh, the translation of this poem. Or, yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's really challenging for undergrad students, Mark, as you may imagine. Uh, this is in La Plata, this is the first year of uh, translation that they have. And the activities, the workshops, or uh, poetry translations were optional for my students. I could not force them to translate poetry. You can, it's an exercise, of course, but not as something, you know, they had to really evolve and commit to doing the task. I would say that um, the challenges in the particular case of this sequence, and uh, perhaps all, all other uh, sequences, are to do with the main features of the form, that is to keep, to stick to the 14 line uh, poem, which is not always that easy to, to do, because we are translating from a language that allows contractions, English, into a language that uh, does not. Of course, we can skip the subject, which English cannot you know, generally, right? So um, the, the form and um, the, the different uh, differences in syntax well, were always there as a challenge. Then this language, economy, simplicity of style, the idea of the focus and the double reading that we get in many of uh, Seymour Main's uh, poems. From the sequence that we just read, uh, perhaps you start is one of the examples. It sounds like a poem, about, um, a reflection on cards, but it's actually something that is telling you about a persona that is uh, perhaps resenting a little bit age. A lot. Right? <laughs> a lot. And in many other cases, uh, perhaps there is um, 
a scene that can be uh, described literally or a, a, a landscape scene. Uh, Canada is celebrated in many of these uh, poems, uh, the Canadian winter, and so, and so on. But then there is the other reflection that is more transcendental, or philosophical, or metaphorical. <coughs> that was a challenge for the students. Mm -hmm. And translating, uh, doing all this through translation, it's not that, you know, one session, we read the poems, <coughs> we talk about the poems. No, we do everything together. So those sessions, two-hour sessions actually, in, uh, in our case, um, would be uh, quite, um, you know, um, would promote really uh, good discussions on the programs and good discussions on the translations. So that uh, translation was used also as um, methodology. I think that was proved really successful with undergrad students. And also the fact that they could translate the whole thing. So after that session, okay, we had translated or come to one version we were more or less happy about of three poems. So we, we met for, in, in this case, for five or six times, and then we would have sessions to revise the work we have done, gaining some perspective, as Veronique, you were telling me um, uh, before. And, well, I think that's, that's the challenge, or well, some of the challenges. And then to understand cultural stuff and religious stuff. Yeah. which are not really uh, familiar for Argentinian students who perhaps have never, most of whom have never traveled abroad or know French. In some cases, <coughs> the contact between uh, French uh, Canada, English Canada is there in the, in the poems. You might perhaps not realize, uh, those of you who are Canadian, uh, but there was a thing with trees, I don't know if you remember in one of the poems, and the way you call these trees here and there and, and many things. And, well, and punctuation was also a challenge when we, I don't know if you remember, when we set up the whole, uh, mm -hmm. the whole book. Yes. Because French and Spanish and English and Portuguese would use spaces differently. Yes. And so uh, Mark and Veronique were very generous <laughs> because they made the, in the, the table of contents look good, even if that was challenging the norms of French. So. Yes. And sometimes I would get uh, emails from students yeah, right. and from you or from the translators, and then I, the longer was Seymour, I became King Solomon. I had to read and challenge. Now, my knowledge of French is adequate, Spanish, Portuguese, I had to really work up a little bit, but I had enough of a sense of it, because I had Latin way back. And uh, I was put in the invidious position of sometimes, you know, I knew whatever I was going to say, they were going to, I wish they would make the decision. I don't want to make the decision. It's their translation. Maybe my work, but I always believe in people are translating. I translate from various languages, mainly Hebrew and Yiddish. I like it when the writer just stays away. I like to stay away and not tell my translator what to do. Uh, my Hebrew translator translated this book, did a funny, you know, visual thing to some of the poems. He couldn't, because Hebrew is so, um, uh, it's, a, it's such a concise language that you could not really take 14 to 14. 14 will always translate to 9 or 10. So I allowed him to break parts of the words into syllables. So it looked more like an E. Cummings poem than one of my poems. But that was fine with me, you know. And I thought I should add, which it just hit me now, why did this form really attract me? Well, uh, uh, Latin was an important part of my high school education. I went to a private school where Latin was important. I think reading, believe it or not, the short poems of Catullus, of Marshall, his epigrams and satires. And I was always looking for a shorter form. Of course, when I was an undergraduate, the Imagist movement was only 40, 45 years old. And my uh, teacher, Louis Dudek, was a great, uh, a great um, a supporter of applying Imagism to the inchoate writing of his students who were trying to write. Um, so when the, when the opportunity arose, and I did a few kind of descriptive and nature ones, just like the few British poets who were doing it. I could not help introduce satire and humor, which was what the British and Irish, the few who were doing the words on it, were not doing. So I, I tried to say, let's open up the form. Let's make it uh, a kind of an epigram. So I, in that way, I thought I'd read something which I liked, something, you know, Isaiah's vision, you know, when the animals would live together. Uh, and I love this short poem. It's called Sleep In. The lamb lay beside the wolf. Which of them got a good night's rest? <laughs> so this is the form which allowed me concision and also humor. And, and I'd say a third of the poems are humorous and satirical. And I got great joy out of it. And I should, I'm thinking behind now, I, I was mentored 
both directly and indirectly by, when I lived in Montreal in the 60s, F.R. Scott, even though he was dean of law, uh, was a great uh, mentor. I mean, he would walk through the campus and uh, he would see me. I was an undergraduate and literary editor of the Daily. He would say, come on, walk me back to my office. He'd put his arm around me and walk. And I, never, I, I still remember some of his bone mo. One day I spoke to him and said to him, I talked to him about the literary underground. I'll never forget, he had a, a fast wit, which I think made his way somewhat into my own practice. And he said, the underground, he said, you know, Seymour, when you really get down to it, it's rather wormy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of wit he had all the time. And he, uh, he once uh, came to Ottawa U to give a reading, and he got up to read a poem for me. And uh, he didn't like my concrete poetry that I had published in the late 60s. He didn't like concrete. He, like the, he felt it was a little bit of a, too playful for him. So he got up and read a poem, and he called it Seymour, Maine. And then he said, say more, man. <laughs> but then I remembered the first person who offered me a double scotch was at a conference. I was 19. Frank Scott took me into the bar and gave me a double scotch, which turned my head on. I never drank a double scotch. So I immediately got up and quickly said, libations for F.R. Scotch. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of, uh, kind of playfulness that came in, I think, over the years. I didn't realize I was writing, but it's there in many of these, uh, many of these uh, word sonnets. Yes? Yeah, I think yes. it's, it's Okay, something that Laura didn't mention, or, or well, for the French okay. particularly. I have many things to, do, to say, but I will <laughs> keep it uh, short. Um, I think that this translation uh, gave me, uh, or in Carvillar, how do you say it in English? I cannot translate it in English. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, gave me uh, the way mm. to my. Uh, masters, one, give me some push in, uh, to the subject of my master's degree. Um, I translated short, short stories, which are very small, uh, short forms. And one thing I realized during my master's, but also uh, very much so during the translation of this book, that uh, almost uh, nothing so little is said, and yet so much more is said, which with each of these uh, poems, which I like very, very much, and I fight with my mom for the books you gave me because she doesn't want to let them go, and she wants to read them again and again, and I, I very much love this poetry. Um, I'll it, give you another copy. <laughs> <laughs> and you also, it's funny because you signed one copy of one book you gave me, and it was a 14 word sonnet, the dedication. So, and on, on the other topic, I wanted to add this. Um, for used car, I remember that I had translated um, something different. I said, no, it cannot be just one part. We have to be specific. I want it to be specific. I want it to be this part and then the other. And then I, he, uh, Mark was good. He said, okay, if that's what you want to do, we can try it. But then when I realized the four, uh, tr the translation were going to be put aside from each mm -hmm. other, I thought maybe they will say, what? She doesn't know how to translate this <laughs> word? <laughs> so she makes it up. So I said, okay, I have to uh, give way to that and uh, keep, keep within some boundaries to be more creative. So this actually allows me to be more creative because it gives me bo more boundaries. I cannot, uh, I, I wanted to finish with this word because it's the title, da da da. But so uh, it's like a puzzle, and uh, it married very well for me, uh, emotional uh, aspect, arts, with very uh, logical aspect, in math. Um, so that, uh, was, that made it easier for me, actually, to translate. Um, and also, um, the collision of the four languages, I think, makes appear very nice things. Um, the disappearance of the space after the, uh, the colon, I think, or whatever. 
I wish I didn't mind. Um, <laughs> and forces, like um, Laura said, forces each language to sort of stretch a little bit to its limits makes it uh, alive and very much interesting. So thank you, Seymour. No, 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 I don't have anything. I just want to know. For those who... I think yeah. Oh, there's a question. Well, not really a question. You've been infected with this 14 words. And you wrote one right now. And I wrote one right now. That happens everywhere I go. So this one is taking two of the key things from today's gathering. Wind. That's my friend Jim, he's going to outdo me today. Right. Right. Okay. No, no, I'm just trying to match, okay? So the wind and cookies. <laughs> the wind hungers for cookies with a burning passion that can never be quenched. Uh, <laughs> that's a good, uh, I think, uh, thank you to, to the cookies themselves, which I hope you go and ask. More inspiring, Jim. <laughs> okay, no, I, I just wanted to say one, I think uh, Veronique touched upon this and Nara uh, too. One of the interesting things is that when you translate, usually one of the things you, you have a, a whole bunch of challenges, but you don't think very much, um, except if you're doing poetry, uh, and in this case, poetry, short form on the same page, is you never have to really worry about how your text looks set against either an original or another language. And in this case, as Veronique mentioned, right, she was translating, knowing very well that her text, you could also see on the same page three other versions of that same poem. And that is very, that doesn't happen all that often in poetry. It happens at times in bilingual poetry editions, but that's probably the only place where this happens. So it's, <coughs> it's an extra challenge, but an interesting one. I have, thank you very much, Mark. I have, th thank you to everybody. And I have a million questions actually for each of you, even, but I can't get them all out, so I'm just going to ask Seymour. Um, are you, uh, at some point, do you start writing in translation, but still in English, if that makes sense? Wait, wait, what's my first language of writing? I know, I know that you obviously you're writing it in English, but right. are you thinking at, in a are you thinking ahead as to what it would sound like in the other languages as you're No, I wasn't them? thinking of that, no. I, I didn't think of translation. I write them at the moment when it just comes into my head and I write it, then I revise it because I want to keep to the form. The best ones, I mean, I've written hundreds. I only published, you know, 150. I wouldn't mm -hmm. publish those I don't feel are successful, either in rhythm and uh, in what I'm intending and the suggestiveness of the imagery. There's different kinds of no, I wasn't thinking of that. It's funny you should mention because actually the other day someone asked me, did you ever write another? Yes, I have written in another language and I translated the poems into English. The other language is Hebrew. At some point I was writing in Hebrew, but I never published them. I didn't have the, I didn't have the goal to publish them. I had an excellent, an excellent translator uh, who translated my work into Hebrew, the late Moshe Dor, who, did, uh, who wrote the famous lyric, Arab Shal Shal Shadim. Uh, I didn't dare want to publish them. So actually, one of my books, I won't tell you which one, I have actually a, 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 a slew of poems which are written in Hebrew. I translated them in English. <coughs> but you know, translation is amazing. One of the great Yiddish writers was Isaac Bashev Singer. People don't know, he wrote in Yiddish. He published in the forward Yiddish in New York. And then in the 50s, people began to translate his work, and he got involved with each of his translators. So he actually was a co-translator. And when he translated short stories and his novels, he edited them and rewrote them. And he got the Nobel Prize, which was for the English versions of his work. Because yeah. actually, the English versions, and my, my, this is my thesis, some Yiddish critics disagree with me, were stronger and better than his original Yiddish. So English afforded him the chance, and he, he knew he, English, he lived in New York for, 30, you know, for years. The English versions are the ones we all, get, uh, we all know, and they're the ones from which most translators translate other languages. They don't go back to the Yiddish originals. So it's interesting, and of course, it's another, in Canada, we've had many bilingual writers, not as many as we should have, but in Europe, people were multilingual. We have many writers who wrote more than, more than one language. Yes? Another question, polysemic composition. Could you expand on that a little? 
You use the word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> many, that was me. Many, many seeded, so to speak. Uh, yes, many meanings. Many uh, meanings. What I was explaining before, there are at least two levels of uh, reading that you can have. One that is literal, you know, the seeing at the garage, the car that is getting old, but then there is the reflection. Metaphorical. Yes, the yes. metaphorical yeah. or figurative uh, or religious mm. motive. Like the one he read about, uh, the one you read from that book, yeah. that is taking us back to a passage in the scriptures, which many uh, readers may get, but many others will not. Mm -hmm. And for translators, that is a must. Yeah, so I have the last poem, and I think one of the last poems in the earlier big collection called Ricochet, I have a poem, I don't remember off the heart, but I call it Guest, and it's, it's all about going to a hotel, booking in, and before you know it, you have to book out, but it's not really about a guest. I mean, I wrote it. I wrote it, and then I realized there was another level. I'm just saying, we all come into this life, we cook things, try to get used to it, before we know it, uh, we're getting kicked out, you know? <laughs> did uh, singing in three other languages, did it give you, say, oh, did I say that, did it give you a, a, a deeper insight into actually your English, mm -hmm. into your original one? Did you say, like, uh, Well, I did, did the English, you mean? Like, did realize that, oh, that's even deeper than I thought. Uh, well, and when I finish a collection before I get published, I have three uh, readers, actually former students of my years, they're all the published writers, they're all between 45 and 70, and I give them my manuscript and I ask them to be absolutely brutal with me. I tell them that the new book is coming out, they pass through the three of them, and they are to tell me what they thought of the work they read. I get more out of them, because okay. I don't think uh, another language would really, you know, uh, I don't, but you mentioned, I mentioned Hebrew. I wrote many biblical poems in the 1990s, a whole book of them. And when my Hebrew translation was translated, it was a bonanza for him because he could then pull out the original. Because why use, the, you know, and there's always a tension between the biblical Hebrew and the demotic contemporary, which we don't have in English, unless I sounded like Chaucer at some point, <laughs> or uh, maybe uh, the writer Beowulf, which we don't. There are very few poems of everything. But Hebrew, and there are other, Hebrew and modern Greek have elements of the ancient versions of their languages. So writers writing in those two languages have this wonderful ironic, uh, what I say, ironic uh, resource. And the great poet who did that in Hebrew was Yehuda Michai, who I know. And he, you read his poems and you go from ancient to medieval to modern Hebrew, and each one has different echoes. And you're able to do something you cannot, it's not, you cannot do in English. It's very hard to do in English. Though some poets, I think Jeffrey Hill, the British poet, tried to a certain degree to integrate uh, liturgical English and uh, all kinds of elements, to, but it's a very difficult poetry in English to read. It is a very, uh, you have to really have uh, learning and concentration to be able to really appreciate this poetry. You go out and read, I always like to throw out a name, but go and read Jeffrey Hill. He's tough, he's tough, yeah. yeah. I have a question about those 60 undergraduates. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So when I was listening to the translations, of which I could understand respectively half, all, none, um, they seem very transparent. They seem very liberal almost. It's, it made it seem easy. And I'm sure it was not easy. So what I'm curious about is when those students were working on the translation and they were all working together towards that beautiful, transparent, obvious seeing final version, what were the kinds of problems they were encountering? What sort of categories did their errors fall into? Well, the students I won't mention here in the book. Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of uh, problems. But some of them I have already mentioned. Mm -hmm. So to stick to 14, uh, 14 words. That was uh, harder than we can imagine. To uh, what Mark was saying, knowing that we were going to be uh, together with English, French, and Portuguese, which in some cases gave us clues as to what the best word could be. Then um, what you mentioned about this uh, transparent um, sort of translation, I think it's to do with, uh, well, the uh, Lawrence Renuti's ideas of foreignization or domestication of translation. So uh, there is this notion that we wanted to stick to the letter, as Antoine Bachmann would say, so that the reader would be able to, um, you know, compose the, the poem as he read, as they read, yes, which is a, a different thing. I noticed that uh, our colleagues, uh, Veronique, Matt, and also Sabine, uh, would take the poem, appropriate uh, Seymour's uh, poem, and perhaps um, 
produce a, a poem that could be uh, more of their own, mm -hmm. adapting it to different uses and things. There are two different strategies, but I think that adds to the richness of the book. We had, I don't know if Bernie or Matt remember, a thing about the title, because you had come up with a beautiful title in French, but that did not uh, respect or follow the um, compounds in, mm -hmm. in the other languages. Risse, something? Well, what, what, yeah, what so is it? I, I can't even remember. I, <laughs> yeah, I remember. But what, what is, uh, at least to me, is that when the word in English, of course, right, is this monosyllabic, it's, it's got the W, the D. So, I mean, even visually, it's interesting. Viento y madera is, is, is more musical, like vent y madera in Portuguese, and vent y bois, which is, right? And, and so I was kind of bothered by my, and I probably still am today. Thanks for reminding me. But uh, maybe I'll get a name for members that discussion. One thing I wanted to add, Jennifer, is, and I think this was a problem that I remember. As I said, Veronique did all the work here. Uh, I discussed the, the, some of the dis translations with Veronique about, and one of the things I, I, I felt, and probably the same in Spanish and Portuguese, correct me, c'est les noms composés en français. In French, you have a lot of now, the now. Which is when you're working it in right when you're working in a form with uh, 14 lines, 14 words, you know at times you feel, man, am I really wasting uh, three wasting words. one three line of the day? Yeah. Or so exactly. things like that, yeah. things like yeah. that. That French is not very flexible, nor is nor is Spanish, nor is mm -hmm. Portuguese for that matter. So. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yes, if I can uh, add one thing about this very interesting. Um, subject of uh, la tra tra traduction uh, de la lettre. So that was very present too, and it also, uh, for the French translation, um, and it also impacted in different ways. For example, the last sonnet, um, gravi um, gravité. 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 Yep. So I thought to be true to the letter, and this is just a petty example, I need to finish the sonnet with gravi gravity. This has, in my uh, head, it has to be to be true to the letter. So I took a different path than um, Laura and Tim and uh, Conci in um, Brazil. I I took a, I had to juggle a little bit the order of the word, uh, the meaning. Uh, so I could be true to this letter. Mm -hmm. So you can come up to be true to the letter or to the meaning or to the uh, appropriateness or l'étrangeté. Um, <coughs> but uh, I cannot translate anymore. You will ask me why. And uh, so, so where was I ever? Was I going so you stick to that. So, so, so yes. Uh, so, but it. Okay. What I want to say is, it gives a different result to keep to the letter, mm -hmm. even if you're doing <coughs> the same process. Mm -hmm. One thing in French that is great, and I don't know, I, I, I guess any Spanish and Portuguese would be the French though, I can say. French allows, um, thank God it allows a few things, um, <laughs> allows les inversions. So syntactically French, you can play a bit more perhaps with the syntax. It allows inversions. Uh, and so that, that ha at, at times can help you out, right? Um, but even then, I remember if you have some of those, you have to use the forms in French with the verb, the hyphen, and the T. And, and I mean, the, so, and I, I remember the first few discussions as we count this as, you know, where did we separate? Yeah. What is we one word? One? <laughs> we had the discussion about yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. definition. Well, it actually counted it as one, two, and three. <laughs> yeah. and, in many like cases, that. we came up with 13 or 15. Mm -hmm. So it was either. <laughs> exactly. So I, actually, the French translation, the earlier book on Ricochet, which is available, public access, published by the University of Alabama Press, translated by the French Vietnamese writer Sabine Dune. And uh, I gave her full reign. So a few of the poems, people complained they're her poems more than my poems, fine with me. 
She took, I gave her, I said, you have full liberty, go ahead and do it. But my earliest French translator, the late Pierre de Rizot, I did a selected poems of mine many years ago, and he, he looked at these, and he told me, friendly, he said, oh, okay. So then I gave him permission. He translated a number of them, but none of them came out in 14. They were 13, 15, 16. He, refused, he just couldn't do it. He said, let them stand by themselves. I said, fine. But along came uh, Sabine, and, uh, and you guys were able to do what he, and he's a, was a, a master poet, he just threw his hands up. It was too much for him you know, uh, to do. So we like math. You like math. Like and the math. other thing, remember, the, math. the person who is coordinating this, this book, which I really agree with, is Laura, who is actually multilingual. She's familiar with all four languages. You know, I told you my Portuguese. I have to confess now is not very. It's not. It's, it's rough. And when I got questions about the Portuguese, I thought, Oh God, what am I, how do I know? And my Portuguese neighbor moved away. Besides which, he only has a grade seven education. So I didn't think I could impose on him to say. Tell me which word should be the better word, you know. <laughs> but you are fluent, you know, in the four languages. Yeah. Yeah. And she also has she did a PhD in Chicano American literature. So she has all she is the ideal editor for this book. Can I ask one other yes. question quickly? Seymour, which which language is, is your favorite for these? Oh, I'm not gonna say. I'm going to incriminate myself right now. I'll not say. What I want to tell you, if you want to, you're all welcome. October 24th, Library and Archives Canada, where we're doing a triple launch of an anthology of work from one of my from my students I taught over the years, and the Russian English edition of the poems. And there, I mean, I spoke a bit of Russian as a child, but believe me. And, the, and the, whatever I remember of the Russian is either a few words that my grandmother spoke or some of the phrases I can't repeat that my father used to repeat. <laughs> that he used to hear, for example, the, Bol the Bolshevik soldiers coming to his village and the comments they made about the Cossacks and all the Mensheviks. And I, heard, I used to hear these words and some of my father would sing ironic songs. Uh, and I didn't understand until later that they were actually not fit for polite company. You know? <laughs> but, uh, so, um, can I now, yes, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question for Laura. Laura. For your uh, translator and also a researcher in the field of literature. So when you are translating the poems, uh, because you know that uh, there's often the problem of translatability in translation practice. So when you are translating the poems, uh, were you conscious aware of the fact that uh, you have to sacrifice some aspects of the original poems. Mm -hmm. That is part of the, of, of the job, I think. Yes. To accept, yes. to accept mm -hmm. that there is always something that will be, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that will be lost yeah. in translation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Veronique uh, managed to stay with gravité at the end of the mm -hmm. poem, which was beautiful, a beautiful yeah. choice, because she would have uh, the word in the title and at the end, just in, as in the original, but she had to compromise. Mm -hmm. That was a change in the meaning, uh, which, uh, well, we agreed that was for the benefit of the poem in, in French. But that is always something. Uh, more so when you are restricted by uh, the genre. Yeah, and right. for us, uh, well, that was um, a must. We had to stick to the 14, mm -hmm. uh, the 14 words. Yeah. Um, Some constraints are more negotiable than, than others. others. <laughs> right. But yeah. I would say I, I, I welcome translation. I think because I grew up with five languages as a child, an immigrant child in Montreal, I translate every day. I would go between languages from school, back home, family, uh, grandparents, parents. Uh, you know, and I never thought that I was being a translator right at the very beginning. I had to do it to, to, to function. But I think it's better to do it because the, trans the poems take on another life. I know they're not exactly the same, but there's a new readership. There's other people, and something comes through. Uh, the American poet Robert Lowell worked with, uh, with linguists and did a series of translations in various languages in a book called Imitations. He called them imitations because he rearranged some of the poems. But I think any version, I mean, within reason, translation is worth it. And I think that uh, translation is definitely a great boon to spread knowledge of poetry. Mm -hmm. Poetry, yeah. sorry, poetry yeah. translation is a tough one yeah. because mm -hmm. uh, you know critics. Yeah. Some critics think yeah. that only poets can translate poetry, yes. and we were not poets ourselves. No. And we had undergrad students, not like Bernie. She was a graduate student. I mean, we had really um, people starting doing translation, working uh, on these poems, and we proved them wrong. 
I mean, that is also from the pedagogical angle. Yes, I am a professor of literary translation. That was very important for me. Right? This can be done. I mean, it can, it can always be improved. And that is true of all translations that have been made in, in the history of uh, mankind. Yes. Yes. All translations right. can be improved. Yeah, when we were uh, uh, reading the poems, I always thought of uh, maybe one day when I I'd like to translate the poem into Chinese. Mm -hmm. I would <laughs> love, yeah, I would love, love to have it in Chinese. You know why? I found out that the first edition of a book in China by a good publisher is 30,000 copies. Oh. <laughs> so I would love to see that happen. So you and I should, you and I, you and I should talk afterwards because yes. I've, I've never had a book that reads thirty thousand. One book of my piece with five thousand reprints, but thirty thousand copies. We have a lot for I know. Market, you know. All right. so we should have a chat. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I'm doing research about translation, right. especially literary translation. Right. And I love reading and writing. Right. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you all. Thank you all for coming out.